My name is David Williams. I'm Professor of Obstetric Medicine here at UCL and the hospital UCLH. And I specialize in medical problems in pregnancy, looking after the mother's health. And it gives me really great pleasure uh, today to introduce my colleague and friend for over 20 years, 25 years, uh, Professor Eric Junio, who specializes in, um, in particular fetal medicine, but also the well-being of mothers in pregnancy. And his research has uh, evolved over the years to investigate the role of the placenta uh, in fueling uh, fetal growth and development. And he's done some remarkable research in his time getting into that interface between the mother's womb and the lining of the, of the placenta. He's published widely, written many papers and books, and it gives me really great pleasure to introduce Eric to speak to the title, Disorders of Human Reproduction in the Anthropocene. Eric, over to you. Thank you very much, David, for this very nice introduction. And uh, thank you very much to um, Sana and Sandy for organizing this. Um, I wish we could be live, but obviously we are live virtually, but not face to face. And um, so here we are. So it's always a great honor to, to give the lunch hour lecture. This is only my second one in 25 years at UCL. And this one, as you can imagine, has been postponed a few times um, because of the pandemic. But finally, I decided not to postpone it again. I was hoping to do it uh, live, of course. Um, and so today is the day. And um, didn't realize until recently that actually it's also an important day for the um, you know amateurs of um, Star Wars, uh, this is May the Force be with you. Um, and I hope I will not be shooting at the stars when I show you some of my slides. But anyway, um, there is a lot to discuss about the context of disorders of human reproduction in the Anthropocene. Now, as usual, we try to avoid any conflict of interest. I mean, I have to say that I have two sons, Olivier and Benoit, and that Olivier made this remarkable uh, poster here, which is also on the UCL website and which we're hoping to use um, in an exhibition which has been also postponed due to the pandemic. <clears throat> and I've been the lead developer or the advisor to a different organization from the Royal College um, to NHS England uh, through the late Public Health England. And, and I'm also the co-founder of um, the Sonic Moon Project with Julian Henriquez and O. Thibault de Maizière. I'm just mentioning this because you're going to hear a lot about this in my presentation. Right, so what is the Anthropocene? Um, I mean, obviously, it was an intriguing term, I'm sure, for a lot of you. So if you Google it, you're going to find 5,000 hits. And I took the top one, which is from National Geographic. And it's the unofficial, an official unit of ge geological time used to describe the most recent period in Earth's history. Basically, when human activity started to have a significant impact on the planet, um, climate, and the ecosystem. So what's the link? Um, yes, of course, we are living through a new era of human development. And as far as human reproduction is concerned, I've divided this in two main eras. The first one starting 200 years ago, which is the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, when we started having more air pollution, water pollution, noise and light pollution. And to which you have to add the last 100 years when uh, more people started to smoke, use drugs, medication um, and uh, having a much more hypercaloric diet and at the end I will talk a little bit about cesarean section and the impact it can have um, on the long term of human production. <clears throat> of course this didn't start um, 200 years ago you know there is evidence of people um, abusing substances like alcohol more than 200 years ago this is the famous um, drawing by uh, William Hoggart of Gin Lane. Um, but what is important is that um, we are, we're almost living um, in the same planet at that time, but now there is certainly a global inequality in terms of wealth distribution, but also in hunger and into the distribution of pollution. And if you look at these maps, um, they overlap in a significant way. And you will see that the map of maternal mortality is almost identical um, to these two maps. 
Interesting concept uh, that I came across uh, when preparing uh, this lecture is uh, the fetal matrix. And I decided to use it um, to describe what happens to the fetus in utero in the Anthropocene. And this uh, term was um, defined by Peter Gluckman and Mark Hanson, who had the pleasure to work with at UCL when I started at UCL. And um, basically what we're going to do is to look at the impact of environment and individual human behavior on this fetal matrix, which is the environment where the fetus grows. Um, the book um, that I just showed you, which is really an interesting book to read, if you want to know more about uh, the fetal matrix, derives from the Barker hypothesis. Um, and David Barker was a physician epidemiologist who came up with this um, developmental origin of other disease, the Barker hypothesis, and basically showing that adverse environment in the womb and during infancy might be linked to the risk of chronic disease in later life. And I think this is now well established. Um, it's more than a hypothesis, it's a more established concept. And it started with this paper in the BMG, where they had access uh, to a group of very rigorous midwives um, in Lancaster, in Preston, who were weighing placenta um, you know, to the gram in the 1930s and early 40s. And um, they then, Barker and his team, measured the blood pressure of these people born during that time. Um, at the age between 46 and 54. <laughs> and what they realized is that the mean systolic blood pressure, blood pressure increased by about 15 millimeter of mercury as the placental weight increased from 450 gram to 680 gram. By contrast, it fell by about 11 millimeter of mercury as the birth weight increased from two and a half kilo to three and a half kilo. So basically, Small babies with big placenta seem to be at much higher risk of developing high blood pressure in later life. <laughs> now, what does the environment do to this fetal matrix? And certainly over the last 200 years, as I showed you initially, there's been an increase in air pollution and there is mounting evidence that this air pollution is associated with an increased risk of preterm labor. Of course, we also have water pollution, which I will show you um, a slide in a minute. And then you have noise and light pollution, which indirectly may be linked also to an increase in preterm labor through maternal stress, anxiety, mental illness. But what is important in this connection between air pollution and preterm labor is the fact that very recently in Nature, this paper by Bovetol was published showing the presence of black carbon inside the placental tissue. And that is really a revolution in understanding how <clears throat> pollution can affect, you know, the fetal matrix and fetal life in utero. There are also an increasing number of studies uh, showing an association with miscarriages, subfertility, and hypothyroidism, so the thyroid not functioning as it should um, in children. Obviously, there's a lot of confounding factors in those, but I think that the presence of black carbon inside the placenta is quite convincing that you know, the direct effect of this black carbon, which comes directly from car emission um, or other source of pollution um, into the placenta. Water pollution obviously has existed probably for an even longer time than car pollution. And one of the most um, uh, tragic example um, is that of uh, the Minamata uh, factory, the Chizo factory in Minamata, which was um, pouring water contaminated with mercury into the harbor of that uh, little town. And of course, um, in Japan, the main diet is based on fish. And um, this is the result of what happened with exposure of um, fish contaminated with high doses of uh, mercury um, in utero. The strange thing, um, and I, I can say the shocking thing, is that uh, this association between mercury and fetal malformation was discovered in 1956. This is when the whole scandal broke out. It's only 19. 68 that the Japanese government decided to close that factory. Now, we also had the plastic and um, this is becoming of course an important topic of conversation. You may have seen the Seaspiracy documentary and uh, Netflix documentary 
Um, but what I'm much more concerned with um, when it comes to human reproduction is the microplastic, because in another recent paper, you have here the first evidence of uh, the presence of microplastic inside the human placenta. And this was published only a couple of months ago. So again, this is quite intriguing evidence that, uh, you know, our change in uh, the change that we induce in the environment are having a direct effect on the most important organ, which is obviously the one that transfers all the goods and nutrients and produce all the protein that are essential to the fetal development. Now, because this is a lunch hour lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about food. And, um, you know, we have, um, it, it goes and, and comes back. Um, I remember a patient asking this question 20 years ago, and then it disappeared for a while, but now it's again um, on the agenda and you will find a lot of um, information um, on the internet. Why eat my placenta? I suspect that there might be a link with the Kardashian um, business empire. Um, and then you can find all sorts of cooking recipes. Now, think about it twice. Um, so I've just told you that the placenta was accumulating things like black carbon, microplastic. And of course, there's a lot of cadmium if you are exposed to cigarette smoke. Do you really want to eat that? I mean, do you really want to eat this you know, organ that accumulates, filters all the good stuff, but also all the rubbish that comes, you know, through um, our circulation. I don't know. Um, but another very common question that um, is still, you know, the number one question asked uh, by parents to be during pregnancy is can I eat sushi? So we're staying into the uh, food environment. And of course, you can eat sushi because it's the quality of the sushi that matters rather than, you know, the composition of the sushi. But another intriguing question, um, and it probably comes um, second in all the questions I've been asked um, on a daily base, is can my fetus hear my voice and my partner's voice inside a womb? And um, this question in particular was asked by one of my patients um, on behalf of her husband, um, who was really concerned about going to a concert at the O2, a rock concert where there was going to be high decibel. And that's what triggered our interest um, in uh, research in the effect of sound on the fetus in utero. And we know about it's more than sound, it's, it's noise pollution. Uh, and there's also this intriguing uh, little device that is supposed to trans transform your fetus into a little Mozart by exposing it to nice music in utero. So it's moved from having, you know, a MP3 on your belly to an in internal um, little speaker here. I mean, to me, it never made any sense because um, this is a closed cavity and there is no propagation of uh, music there, but simply of noise. But it triggered the Sonic Womb project. So Julian, um, Oat and myself started this project almost a decade ago. Um, we've been joined by Anna David, who's given us a lot of support. And uh, Pierre Gela is now the lead investigator on this project. When we started trying to understand a little bit more about fetal exposure to noise and sound, we realized very quickly that hearing is the only sound that is stimulated continuously inside the womb by both environment sound and internal maternal sound, mainly the maternal voice. You have here the fetal sound channel, you know, the channel one, which we described as a stomach noise and the heartbeat which crosses through the amniotic cavity. Then you have the external sound, which are filtered obviously through the abnormal wall of the mother. And then you have the mother itself, which is transmitted essentially along the spine, plus of course her voice may be reverberate, reverberated and comes as an external sound. But what is really important is that there's an abandoned, very um, high quality literature in some of the top uh, medical and scientific journals on the fact that sound actually modulates the fetal brain development in utero and uh, could be a part in lang language acquisition um, after delivery. It was actually not possible to do this kind of experiment um, on human, but we did evaluate the fetal exposure to external loud noises using a sheep model. And uh, what we found was quite intriguing because 
we found that it depends, of course, on the frequency of the sound. And anything above 10 kilohertz will be transmitted to the amniotic sac. But we also found that sound frequencies are only attenuated by as little as three decibel. And previous studies on, on sheep and, and, and goat had shown that it might be 25 decibel. Um, but using modern technology, we found that actually there is very little attenuation. So that obviously raised the question um, about protecting the fetus from load noises in utero. Uh, you know, by law, um, a factory has to provide the workers with ear protection when the average uh, noise um, increases to 85 decibel. Um, but you have environment where it's over 100 and 110 decibel, like in you know, some part of the underground, for example, and how do we protect the fetus? So Pierre is continuing his research um, at the UCL Medical Physics and Biomedical Engineering, and I'm sure that one day he will present one of these lectures with the result of this fascinating project using phantom, uh, phantom model. The ultimate aim, of course, is, is not only to protect the fetus in utero, but to also protect the premature newborn who is going to miss sometimes months of its neurological development exposure to natural sun and to recreate a more natural environment in the incubator. I mean, you may not know this, but as soon as you switch on the incubator, all the equipment is necessary, of course, to keep um, this newborn alive. It goes from 53 decibel to 68 decibel, the limit in most neonatal units being 55 decibel, there's certainly something that we can do by better understanding the transfer of um, noise into the womb and recreate a sort of womb environment for um, the premature baby. <clears throat> also been more than just science and, and hard work, we also had a little bit of fun and opportunities for public engagement. Um, this is the swarp, uh, which is basically an egg that um, um, was designed at Goldsmiths College and uh, which we presented at the Brain Forum in 2016 and basically gave you um, the environment, the sonic environment of what a fetus uh, might hear in utero. Uh, we are continuing to develop this um, a swag, but um, it has been delayed, unfortunately, by the pandemic. Um, we got a lot of interesting um, comment on our blog, and we have got 120 uh, participants to the Brain Forum in Lausanne uh, um, using the swag during the two days we were there. And then we're hoping to develop you know, a much larger exhibition. And so if anyone has any idea of how we can get more funding for this, um, we are definitely open um, to collaboration with anyone who might be interested in, in developing this project. Right, let's continue with um, the second phase of um, human exposure to a new environment, um, which is obviously um, what happened in the last 100 years. More mothers are smoking, um, more people are using drugs and mothers as well. Hypercaloric diet are a result of our new um, access to um, you know fast food and and um, and then of course we have design section I'm not sure that it's the same impact as you will see but there is also no doubt and again there is a lot of evidence for this that tobacco smoke and drug use um, are a main factor in the risk of preterm labor and birth they also affect directly um, the fetal development uh, responsible for fetal growth restriction in utero we have shown a long time ago now, um, when I was still a PhD student, um, that um, trophoblastic necrosis, which is basically the layer that covers the placental villa, which are the essential organ inside the placenta, show evidence of necrosis from nine weeks of gestation in mothers who smoke. And then, of course, we will never forget the thalidomide um, and the effect of other drugs, um, like this anti-epileptic drug or the vitamin A, which is used against acne. And then, of course, you have cocaine and crack, which have major impact on the fetal organ development, um, and in particular, also on the limbs um, development. I still have patients asking me um, if it's all right to take uh, cocaine or crack uh, during pregnancy. Um, you'd be surprised. 
No, the tobacco and alcohol, which obviously are the most commonly used substances um, in our daily life. As I said, there is absolutely no doubt that it's the main, main cause of premature delivery. It's also potentially a cause of miscarriages and uh, stillbirths. Um, it has also been associated with the development of fetal anomalies such as uh, cleft lip. Alcohol in large amount is also associated with the fetal alcohol syndrome. There's a discrepancy when you, you read the medical um, press and, and the general press, um, because you have about 22,000 hits in PubMed showing the effect of smoking during pregnancy, and only about 4,000 uh, for alcohol abuse in pregnancy, but you rarely see anything, again, smoking and pregnancy in the general press, while any even small article unpublished uh, with no control group um, that ends up, um, you know, in a preprint in somewhere um, in the internet will immediately raise the attention of the press, while none of the, you know, smoking um, and pregnancy article um, achieve the same impact. <clears throat> I wonder why. Another issue, which is obviously um, a modern one, is maternal obesity. Uh, we now have about sixty-seven percent of American and English women who are overweight uh, with a BMI over 25 or obese, with a BMI over 30, um, which is not a new way of um, evaluating uh, people's weight. Um, it's a problem that affects the whole of the world, but more specifically some countries in North America, um, in the Middle East, um, and it's starting to happen um, you know, in Australia, in most European countries. It's a heavy burden, um, not only on the patient uh, herself, but also on the healthcare services, because it now costs more than smoking um, in the USA. So what's the impact of this on the fetal matrix? Um, and this is where this sort of transgeneration epigenetic effects come into the equation. Maternal obesity is known to increase the risk of miscarriages, neurotube defect, essentially through gestational diabetes, which also um, increase the risk of having a macrosomic baby, which is a baby that's over four kilos or 10 pounds in general. And this is also associated with more hypertension, preeclampsia, um, and the higher risk for the newborn to um, um, end up with a gut necrosis and necroenterocolitis of um, the gut system, which is obviously extremely dramatic, and uh, general sepsis. And simply a high maternal BMI has been associated with an activation of all the different placental inflammatory pathways, which is probably also what happens when you get black carbon particle in the placenta. So you dysregulate completely the redox balance, the way oxygen is being metabolized and the release of free radical inside the placental tissue. And that leads to um, a dysfunction of the mitochondria, which is a little engine that you find in, in, in every cell, so which is absolutely essential and which is being transmitted um, you know, through the mother line um, and which mutates about once every 3,000 years. But I'm not sure that what we are exposing the fetus to and its placenta will not make these mutation much more common now. We also know from um, amounting evidence that children from obese mothers have a lower microbiome by biodiversity. So think about the Amazon forest, when we damage you know, some layers, you have an impact on all the different layers. And instead of having 1,000 different um, type of bacteria, viruses, parasites, and other um, particles that normally exist in our digestive tube, and which are essential for our immune system, the children from these obese mother who tend to have themselves less than 100 different uh, species inside their gut are being born with less than 100 um, species and at much higher risk of childhood obesity and diabetes. So if you want to know more about this, I think that you should have a look at this um, interesting paper, which summarizes the effect of epigenetic inheritance. And you see immediately that diet stress, exposure to toxins, metal solvents, air pollutant, here we come back with the black carbon and the particular matter, dioxins and other chemicals, mercury can have an impact on both the sperm and the oocyte and thus have an impact on the development 
of um, the fetus. Right, so um, now we've looked at the fetal matrix. Let's have a quick look at the maternal matrix, obviously the uterus and what we're doing to this uterus um, by um, you know, doing cesarean section. It's now become the number one major surgical procedure out of about 141 million births in the world in 2015, there were 29 million cesarean section. That's around 21%. In the US, um, um, where you have a, an incidence of cesarean section of 33%, you have 1 million cesarean section. And here in the UK, um, you have 180,000 um, cesarean section every year. I mean, this obviously always generates an impact in the media. I'm not sure they got it right here because um, here you see Posh Pais um, having her door open for her, but um, the two Posh to push actually should be referring to the fact that she opted to have a cesarean section in her first pregnancy and had another three since. Um, and, you know, a lot of uh, stars around the world have uh, opted for the same procedure. Now, don't take me wrong. Of course, cesarean section has changed the obstetric world. It has decreased together with transfusion, antibiotic, and, and modern anesthesiology method. The maternal mortality rate um, enormously. You see that the introduction of this new technique in the access uh, you know, to transfusion antibiotics and, and cesarean section by competent surgeon in the mid of the 40s um, has really decreased the maternal mortality rate. So from you know, around eight, 900 per 100,000 live births, now we're talking about four or three um, in some countries. Unfortunately, as you see in some developing countries, it's still at the level it was in our part of the world um, in Victorian times. And again, this procedure is essential. You can evaluate that out of the 180,000 cesarean sections that are being done every year in the UK, at least 100,000 actually saving mothers and babies' lives every year. But then what happens um, is that the cesarean section, the section rate has doubled in the last 15 years, it's now 21%, and it continues to increase by 4% every year. And there are about 6.2 million unnecessary cesarean section every year. And most of them, I mean, 50% of them, uh, at least half, as you can see, are done in China and Brazil together. There are countries who are quickly catching up. Um, Egypt, for example, Turkey, um, Mexico is going into the 50s as well, where half of the women, in Brazil we've known for a long time, half the women are actually being delivered by cesarean section. And this is rather strange because you see the same continent as Egypt, you have the Maasai here, which uh, have a cesarean section rate, and these are necessary cesarean section rate, this is not limited to access, of less than 5%. But if you look at our population, and it's the same in big cities in Africa, the rate of cesarean section is now 21% plus. This is the map I was referring to, which you could actually overlap significantly with the one on air pollution and access um, to wealth um, and uh, starvation. And you see that it um, no, almost is overlap apart from North America with um, access to cesarean section. So there's no doubt that in countries where you have rates of less than five to ten percent it's because most of the women don't have access to a cesarean section while those who have rates over 20 percent is because um, there is a high demand for non-medical cesarean section when the who recommended 20 years ago never to go above 10 to 15 percent it was obviously um, unrealistic and you know rates around 15 to 20 percent have to take into account maternal age, as I said, maternal BMI changes, but also the influence of the media. And this is a fact of uh, modern, the modern world. And so 20% is probably the ideal um, rate for cesarean section. Now, a lot of this obviously is doom and gloom, um, but I want to reassure mothers who decide that it's the best option for them to have a cesarean section that the complication rate is actually very low. Um, when you think about the complication after the operation itself, the immediate postoperative complication, you see that um, 
probably the highest risk is for postpartum hem hemorrhage, but it is very similar to the one that you're going to uh, find for vaginal birth um, after one cesarean section, of course. And uh, this may also be linked to the fact that uh, emergency cesarean section are at much higher risk than elective cesarean section for various complications, but these complications have now become very rare. Infection is well controlled by antibiotics. Surgeons are usually better trained and, um, than they were 100 years ago, and the complications, um, um, this type of complication, anesthesia is extremely performant, now and safe, um, you know, have become extremely rare. But what about log the long-term complication? If we're increasing the number of cesarean section, and know we have in some countries more than 50% of deliveries by cesarean section, what will happen to these models? Because countries like Turkey and Egypt have a very high fertility rate um, compared to you know, countries like the US or, or most European countries where the fertility rate is, is around two or less than two. In those countries, you have fertility rate that um, above three or four. And so that means that many mothers would end up having four, five, six, seven cesarean section. So after one cesarean section, like for any other operation, you will end up with adhesion in your pelvis in 70% of the cases. Um, you may also, by damaging the womb, end up with um, 40 70% defect of the womb. And all these placental related complications, which are in some ways linked to these scar defects, um, miscarriages, stillbirths, placenta previa, accreta. Um, of course, they are not very common, and that's because, again, in our part of the world, um, the fertility rates are low. Um, but, you know, it's something that we need to discuss um, when patients are asking us for, um, you know, repeat cesarean section for no medical reason. And then there is mounting evidence again that uh, cesarean section may affect as well the newborn microbiome, like, you know, maternal obesity does. So what happens when you do a cesarean section, when you create a scar and the scar um, does not heal um, by regenerating muscular fibers, you end up with a mixture of collagen, um, myofibers, which are the essential muscular fibers of the uterus, which are in complete disarray, tissue edema, inflammation, elastosis. So this scar is thinner than the normal muscle, less elastic, much more prone to injury, and um, it will um, be responsible for some um, development of a scar defect and possibly in, in, in next delivery if um, there is attempt to do a vaginal birth in a uterine rupture. Although again, this is a very low risk. It is due to the fact that the, the scar tissue is thinner and contains um, you know, very few um, myofibers and that in good condition. And the lower segment of the uterus is quite prone to these scar defects because it contains less muscular fibers. Actually, the number of muscular fibers decrease as you get um, into the cervix and then you have more elastic fiber because this part of the uterus has to expand first in the third trimester to accommodate the growing fetus and the presentation. Um, and then of course, during the labor to enable the fetus to come through the cervix. So this is a very fragile area. And these are a few examples of, um, I mean, I take all the responsibility here, but these were cesarean section that were done um, for a medical reason. Five years after the first cesarean section, you see here a small defect. This is um, the uterus, this is the cervix. And this is another view, the first cesarean section done as an emergency which we tend to do a little bit lower because of the effacement of the lower segment. And this is the second one, which was an elective C-section, um, seven years after for this one. And this is uh, 16 years after, that's one of the first C-section I did um, at, um, I mean, that I've been following since then, um, that I did at UCH. And you see here the scar tissue is still visible 16 years after the birth of her second um, child. So what about the cesarean scar defect? Um, I said um, earlier that um, you risk having one of these large defects, which we call a niche, and they can really be as large as the rest of the uterus, as you can see in this um, picture from my colleague, uh, Professor Jurkovic. 
um, that uh, 40 to 70 percent, depending on the number of C-section that you've had before, can develop this kind of niche. So not surprisingly, there's also a risk that the next pregnancy will implant inside that defect, and the risk is one in 2,000. And then about half of these pregnancies will develop into a placenta accreta, which means that basically the placenta is so embedded inside the scar tissue that part of it is, becomes impossible to detach at delivery. And you can imagine the consequences with this kind of vascular dilatation of trying to uh, remove that bit of the placenta that's stuck um, inside the uterine wall. And there is a direct link between the number of cesarean section that we have been performing and the prevalence of this placenta accreta syndrome. You see that, you know, since the 1980s, when we were doing less intense cesarean section in most European countries, in the UK in particular, the rate of uh, placenta accreta was about one in five to 10,000. And now it's around one in a thousand. And now we are performing nearly 30% of cesarean section. What about countries like Turkey and Egypt, where they're quickly reaching 60% of their deliveries? Um, it has become a real epitome of placenta accreta spectrum. So the odd ratio of having a placenta accreta after you've had one cesarean section is about three. Um, depends obviously on the quality of the diagnosis of the condition um, during pregnancy and the delivery, but these are earlier data from the US and you see that it obviously increases with the number of previous cesarean section, typically like the rate of the cesarean section defects. So that shows you the connection between damaging the uterus and having this type of very complex uh, placental problem. And the reason for that is that this defect probably um, because it interferes with the whole endometrial cavity flow, or it interferes with the normal signaling between the blastocyst um, and the uterine cavity, or the lack of decidua. Um, in about, you know, two of the cases, I mean, you increase the odds ratio by about two of women who've had one cesarean section, you will end up with a placenta previa there. And of course, if you're very unlucky, it will also develop into a placenta accreta. So it seems to be directly linked in terms of pathophysiology as well to the development of these scars during, due to cesarean section. And this is an interesting paper because we know 10 years down the line, it was um, published in 2011 using a mathematical model um, and they show that if the cesarean section rate continued to rise in the USA, as they have had um, in previous year to 2011, by 2020, so that's only six months ago, the rate would be 50%. Fortunately, this didn't happen. It's only 35%, so the treat is 35% in the US. But if it goes to 50%, and that's a hint for countries like um, Egypt and Turkey, um, you would have um, an increase immediately in the numbers of placenta previa, placenta accreta spectrum, and of course, and um, all the related maternal deaths to these two conditions, which um, can be associated with massive obstetric hemorrhage. And this is an example um, of a case um, in Cairo from my colleague, um, Professor Ahmed Hussain, who I'm closely working with at the moment on this topic. And you can see here the complete remodeling of the uterine wall in a patient who's had um, five cesarean section before, with the placenta being completely stuck here. And here you can see the placental tissue inside the myometrium. I mean, this is scar tissue, it's not normal muscle anymore. And you see the villi is, um, have managed to embed themselves, so they're impossible to detach unless you remove part of the uterus or the entire uterus. So that's the result of this increase. Now, there is light at the end of the tunnel, and I've just found for um, this presentation these uh, two papers on using stem cells to try to repair um, uterine scar. This is a rat model, um, which um, managed to show that um, using amniotic um, epithelial cells could regenerate um, a uterine scar. And uh, here they've used umbilical cord cells, stem cells in the treatment of uh, skin scar. Obviously, I'm much more interested in the um, cesarean scar model, um, although the patient might be more interested in her skin scar. Um, this is really hope that we will manage to address this issue and we won't continue to have this incredibly uh, complicated case, which included in the UK are associated regularly um, with maternal deaths.
So what about the rest? You know, this is the scar. Of course, this is a mechanical problem that we create. Um, there's an abandoned literature um, between uh, 2000 and um, now we'll show you the latest one, showing that milk samples from mothers who had an elective cesarean section contain different bacterial microbiota. So immediately you can see the influence on the newborn microbioma. Um, um, that you also influence the immune response in the newborn. Um, there's also an association which may be linked to the microbioma um, with childhood obesity and type 1 diabetes. Of course, a lot of these studies um, do not take into account uh, the fact that uh, metal obesity increases the risk of cesarean section. And therefore, there might be a link between the need for a cesarean section um, and these uh, complications. Uh, also, there's a lot of literature showing a link between the use of um, antibiotics um, before delivery and the development of asthma and allergic disease. And these are published um, in general, especially recently, in, in very serious journals, in top journals in, in science, as you will see in this paper, which was published um, at the end of last year. This is a study um, in the UK where they have, and I'm sorry because it's a lunch hour lecture, they have studied feces samples from newborn um, at full time and six to nine months after birth. And those who were born by a cesarean section had the microbiome dis disrupted by the transmission of um, less maternal bacterial strains, but um, by contrast, a high level of colonization by opportunistic pathogen, uh, mainly those that you find in hospital environment, which is obviously where the cesarean sections are being done. Now, you also have a similar effect for vaginal delivery if you have used antibiotics um, before delivery and in babies who are not breastfed during the neonatal period. So this raises an important question and certainly uh, will deserve more research in the future. Uh, these are important component of um, the fetal matrix and, and, and life after birth. So we were supposed to be in the Darwin Theater. Um, I think that maybe it's better that we do this um, you know, virtually because um, Darwin may be turning um, in his grave now with what we have done to our unnatural evolution. Um, I'm not sure the survival of the fittest works anymore um, with the epigenetic effect of um, black carbon, microplastic, mercury, Tabasco, noise antibiotic, et cetera, that we are exposing our fetuses uh, to. And this is a very nice poster from uh, the Better the Future organization, which uh, states that when you are pregnant, you're also pregnant with your grandchild. I hope that um, you know politicians who are going to be involved in the next uh, conference in the UK on climate change will not only consider, and of course this is extremely important, our children and the wildlife, uh, which is essential to the survival of this planet, but also the unborn generation. And I really think that um, it is time to make these politicians aware that um, if they're not too concerned about climate changes or they just pretend they are, but they are not doing anything really active about it, they should think about their grandchildren and all the generation that will follow. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Um, Eric, thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Absolutely fascinating putting human in reproduction into the current stage and how it influences um, the development of our children and our grandchildren. Um, we've got some questions, um, specifically actually about cesarean sections, but before we go on, I just want to remind all viewers to use the Slido um, website to post questions um, and then, then I can, um, challenge Eric with them. So the first one's from Tobias. Eric, a very general question. What do you think is the cause of the rise of cesarean section rates globally? Um, obviously, there were, there are these factors, which is, you know, maternal age, which and has, a, has had an impact, you know, the average age of giving birth, when I started at UCH was 24. And now it's 31. So 
suddenly we have more and more women over the age of 40 um, giving birth. And whatever you do, um, the risk of cesarean section is around 50% when you're over 40, which doesn't mean you shouldn't try, but obviously you have to be prepared for the fact that, you know, I tell the patient, you know, yes, I, I would love to run the marathon and win it. But no competition, you know, yeah. <laughs> when it comes to competing with, you know, a 22 year old who um, has been doing this and is extremely fit. In fact, there's a sort of follow up question, uh, Eric, about um, how can we start to reverse the current upward cesarean section rate trend globally? And would this be a good thing? Um, I've, I've been trying hard with my colleagues in, in Egypt, which um, I've been I'm going there regularly uh, until the pandemic. And they have been trying at the national level, including um, in, in football stadiums. Uh, maybe they could hire Mo Salah, their celebrity footballers, to, to, to you know, make a speech. But it has become a trend and it has become a fashion. And, in, you know, Egypt is, is um, low to medium income countries. But as soon as people have money, they want to have the same delivery as their friends. So I've been talking to women whose husband had been promoted, um, who now had the means to have a cesarean section. It's not very expensive, of course, um, for our standards. It's something like five hundred to one thousand dollars in Egypt privately. Um, but they want to have it because even if they've had a few normal deliveries before, their friend had a cesarean section, so they want to have one as well. Mm. So, you know, we're talking to women who've had sometimes four normal deliveries. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how do you reverse that? Is well, yes. What about sort of um, you need fashion leaders to fuck um, yes. the tre trend? I guess, don't you? Um, but fashion leaders are opting for design section or sorry. I know. I know. That's they the problem. Want to do it themselves. Yeah. Um, and also a, a question. Uh, following up again, do cesarean sections increase the rate of childhood obesity and I guess therefore adult obesity, or is that just a correlation with more obese women having cesarean sections? Yes, I, I did put that in my slide and, and obviously a lot of these studies are biased because they don't take into account this type of confounders and the fact that the mothers may not be very healthy, maybe smoking, you know, it, it's, it's, it's too big to push, if you want, um, mm. well, too posh to push. Yeah. It's also something that, you know, we need to address and, and, and help these women uh, before they get pregnant. There's a preconception counseling, I think, is increasingly important mm. in this context. And, and this is also a platform that um, could help, you know, discussing the delivery rather than waiting for the last minute after they've been bombarded with, you know, adverts on, on the internet and, and for fake news and in fact um eric if i might just press you on this that, that um although we're getting more obese over time is it true that our skeleton is becoming more android you know is is the mother's pelvis mm. less amenable to a vaginal birth and if she was obese having a big baby then maybe the cesareans are unnecessary um i mean from the literature I read on this, um, and it's mainly coming from anthropologists, um, this all happens when we started becoming, you know, when we settled and became um, farmers, because the way we bend to cultivate the ground um, has, in a, in a way, modified our pelvis. But you also have genetic evidence showing that it only mutates once every 3,000 years. But no, it's not because you have, you know, a big size that you have a big pelvis. You probably have the same pelvis um, as anybody else. So your BMI is not directly related to your pelvis, which is not directly related to your, your BMI. And of course, the weight of your fetus is going to be related to your BMI, diabetes, etc. Your fitness is going to be related to your BMI. And all these are important components in trying to, you know, decrease cesarean sections. Okay, great, thank you. Um, some other interesting questions here. What, what is the safest method of induction of labor in women with previous sections, one or two? Do as little as possible. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Just uh, wait for things to happen. Don't let them go too much over 40 weeks. If possible, just break the waters around 40 weeks, 39, 40 weeks. 
Uh, it, it all depends for the, on the reason of the previous design section. If you, if you had someone who had, you know, three days labor, who never dilated and had a, a baby that was, you know, seven, eight pounds, and the next pregnancy, the baby is nine pounds at a term, I think you're really taking a risk for nothing because you obviously, obviously have evidence that it didn't work the first time. And then you have the scar risk plus the fact that the second baby tends to be a little bit bigger than the first one. So I think reducing cesarean section is not, shouldn't be based on increasing the number of VBAC or vaginal births after cesarean section. We shouldn't push women into having a VBAC when they've had a complicated first delivery. What we need to do is to decrease the first cesarean section. Yeah. Okay, slight change of subject here. What are your thoughts, opinion on vaginal seeding practices as a probiotic measure for the newborn? Oh, wow, well, well, that's one. You know, <laughs> you need to speak to the pediatrician about that. Yeah. When, you, when you think that in many places, they don't scream for strep B, mm -hmm. group strep B, streptococcus B. I mean, do you really want to put this in the mouth of your baby i mean this is complete nonsense this is the only time when nature behaved like a tabloid exactly. when i published that uh, paper which i use in some of my presentations it's, it's based on three cases and of course they try to screen them for absolutely everything that you know could be a pathogen to the fetus i mean it makes no sense to me i think breastfeeding is probably a much better one because you want to give your baby's microbioma um, we should help women who have had cesarean section to breastfeed because you have your skin microbiome, which is as good as you, I mean, probably better in terms of um, the nasty bacteria you can find um, okay. inside your body. But, yeah, so that's a no then on, the, on that one. <laughs> no, um, this is yeah. absolute madness. I mean, this is not me saying this. You just, yeah. The Royal College of Pediatrician, they we were open arm when they started yeah. they're trying to convince women to do this. Um, thank you, Eric. Um, so sometimes women having elective cesarean sections request vaginal seeding for the neonate to improve gut microbiome. What's your advice? I think no, is that. Yeah. Is it confirmed that the placenta has a microbiome? It's another question. Um, also a good question. Uh, yes, there were studies showing that you have, um, you know, PCR study amplifying part of the genomes of some bacteria inside the placenta. I've only seen one paper. I haven't seen any confirmation of that. Um, theoretically, the amniotic fluid is completely sterile. Um, of course, you can have infection with parasites and bacteria, you know, listeria being a common one. Um, and oxoplasmosis, um, which is another, uh, you know, well-known one. Um, but naturally, the normal bacteria of your digestive system, which is where 80% of your microbiome is and which probably regulates your entire immune system, do not seem to cross that easily. Yeah. Maybe bits of it. Yeah. Certainly immunoglobulins. Thank you. Um, so Eric, here's a question from our leader, Anna David. Um, how worried are you about the risks of air pollution and the effect on the fetus and placenta? And do you think it's time for doctors to warn women about this risk? I think we need to take this to the next level. And this is what Public Health England is doing at the moment. And, and I'm you know, involved as an advisor to that, that, that group is, is for the politician to um, support the women. Um, maybe in the construction industry by providing better filtration, because you're not going to be able to move women. If you give them advice about pollution because they live next to King's Cross, you know, they might not be able to move to the countryside for their pregnancy. So what we need to do is to implement, you know, national policies for polluted area to um, prevent exposure to pollution, because you can actually filter the air that comes into your house through air conditioning, for example, um, by improving the filtering system. Um, and, and that's certainly something that, you know, I hope the politician will, will take on board when we present um, the report to them um, at the end of the year. Great. Eric, um, it looks like there aren't any more questions on the Slido. Um, we've got, ah, one more has just popped up. Nice question, actually. Does high altitude and low oxygen tension affects placental development? 
Yes, it does. I mean, I would refer to some of the papers I've been involved in. Um, and, you know, that, that's probably not really the ideal platform to discuss that. And I'm happy to discuss this with that person individually if they want to send me an email, because it's too complex to discuss that. You know. Yeah. I mean, yes, it's an environment. And yes, it's interesting from that point yeah. of view that, you know, when the Chinese started to colonize Tibet, Mm. Um, you know, and it was the same with the Spaniards in, in South America, in, in Bolivia. They didn't have a successful pregnancy in, in Bolivia for 150 years. It's only when they started mixing with the local population that they started having a successful pregnancy. So it's either miscarriage or stillborn or neonatal death. So it really does seem to have an effect. And um, hypertension as well, wasn't it? Really? Hypertension as well, yes. Yeah. So. yeah. Great. Um, well, we, we live in dangerous times, um, and I think we've just uh, got to do something about the environment to help the species, not just us, but many, many, many others. Eric, that's been a fantastic talk, really um, broad ranging and uh, focusing on, on the way that uh, our environment has, uh, we've affected our environment, which is coming to bite us back and affect the way we re reproduce. Thank you very much on behalf of everyone listening for that great talk. Thank you very much, David. And I want to mention to everyone actually the upcoming lectures are all on the UCL Minds webpage. Um, keep well, see you soon. Thank you for your attention. Thank you to all the participants as well. Thank you very much for the question. They were very nice.